this is the male skull, uh, you have a female version of it too. And if you want to strengthen his interest, you make a... <coughs> with your voice. <coughs> your <coughs> it's not very, really very good for the throat. For your but voice? This, no. <laughs> but that uh, makes him uh, a little bit jealous. He now hears that there is not only a male, but probably his female is just in the neighborhood and he will come very close to you. Now, I should also like to, uh, uh, to warn you very much of trying to do this because um, the owl will attack and it, uh, it is very difficult to see when it comes. I always have plastic glasses when I do it because uh, you may have the owl right in your face. And its talons could catch you. It can and it's very dangerous indeed. Even the small pygmy owl, when you go uh, when you imitate it and uh, you sing. <whistles> which is very easy to imitate. Mm. Then the owl can come from quite far away and just hit your head. It has happened many times to me. And if you imitate, uh, say, the big Ural owl, which in Swedish is called slagugla, which means the owl that hits. Well, then it's dangerous, really very dangerous. Uh, the sound goes... And um, it is very, very dangerous. And you, that's you a really can, big owl, it, if you should. It if hits you, you uh, in a way. It's uh, bigger, much bigger than uh, the tawny owl. And it hits you with a force that makes a grown-up man, uh, a tall man, fall down, really. Well, now, Jan, let's try you out on one of our best-known British songsters. Um, can we ask you, I wonder, to do your imitation of this bird? Let's listen to the recording first. about that one yeah the blackbird we heard even the, this bird will attack and you may if you stand still have him coming right towards your face it's uh, funny to see that little bird so angry mm. and um, uh, well it goes like this then mind you know, this uh, last portion of the song is very essential it's very very high twittering sound because uh, if you don't add that the song is incomplete and actually when you study the thrushes you'll see that this song is very essential for instance the um, uh, song thrush if you imitate the song you should put in these small things and be careful not to let them out it goes uh, But now and then, yeah, and I feel I ought to tell listeners who can't see you that you're not moving about or doing anything special when you're making all these various sounds, except that you've got an expression of intense concentration <laughs> on your face. <laughs> yeah, and also my teeth, the two front teeth, are standing a little bit oblique position, so I twist the whole face. <laughs> I can see you twist your mouth yeah. to make the difference. And if noises. it is cold outside in the morning, it is always difficult. But where I've been now for many years, it's not very cold in the mornings. So that's so. all right. <laughs> Jan, you, you make the most lovely and the most realistic sounds of birds. Have you always been able to do this, or is it something you've learned? Of course I learned it, but uh, for me it has been easy, and uh, I have uh, uh, very good use of it. Of course I can go out and do it f just for the fun of it. I do it so very often because I want to hear the best song, and the song will always in be intensified if I imitate the bird. I can also um, 
find out if a particular bird is in the neighborhood. If I think there is a sleeping nightingale somewhere, I put it on with this sound and uh, I can call in birds from a great distance too. Uh, actually, from the beginning, I think I was rather, I was a, more or less a child when I uh, read some fancy stories about how people could speak to birds and so on and send messages and whatnot, nonsense. But then uh, I tried uh, to imitate the birds and to my astonishment, they came and some of them started to do things which uh, I didn't understand at all. Now, since uh, my time at the university, I think I understand a little bit better what it is all about. And I use it as a key or a tool to understand the behavior of uh, some birds. It's very useful and uh, I would uh, be glad to see other people having the key. But to my astonishment, it seems to be very rare. Uh, perhaps it is just because people in common don't uh, dare to make those uh, stupid uh, sounds or something like that, but it is a very, very good key. Well, thinking back to when you were a child, can, can you remember which birds you first tried to imitate? I think crows. Can you do a crow? <coughs> and they come, of course, but the best thing, if you want a crow to approach, is not uh, the sound of a crow, but take two ravens fighting about something. The raven is much uh, has a much keener vision and would soon see that here is a prey and two of them would come down. If you imitate that, the, all the crows in the neighborhood will come uh, and it goes about this. Uh, incidentally, I had a, a raven performing this beautiful thing just uh, three weeks uh, earlier now. This lovely display uh, flight. Yes, mm. with this uh, a sound I can't uh, really imitate. It's a... like that and it falls. Yes. <laughs> it's a very strong sound. And he did it just because I, I happened to stay uh, rather close to his um, nesting tree and uh, I was concealed and I made the sound and it was beautiful. Blue sky and this metallic bird uh, uh, tumbling around in rolls. It seems to me that you must, as well as having an amazing ability, you must have a very good memory for sounds. I mean, can you recall instantly uh, perhaps a bird which you only heard five or six years ago? Uh, no, uh, I don't think so. I remember uh, slightly more than a hundred species in Sweden. I don't have a record on how many from South America. But sometimes I see that it is difficult for me to remember the exact pattern of a bird song, which I've heard years before. But as soon as I hear it, I either uh, the first time, either I can imitate it or it is impossible. So it's like playing the violin. If you can, can play the violin, you can play different tunes, I presume, just by listening to them. And, um, so it is for me. Some sounds are very uh, difficult to reproduce, really, and it takes some time until you know how to do it. If you think of a whole uh, nest full of young herons, herons, uh, herons yeah. and uh, in comes the mother, it will sound something like this. <clears throat> this is not good for the voice. So on, and, and uh, this is uh, uh, a f peculiar way of um, um, producing the sound because the air goes downwards, down in my lungs. You're sucking <laughs> the sucking, sucking the air in. in. Yes. Yes. And otherwise, I should tell listeners the only thing I could see that you were doing was that at one stage you cupped your hand. Yes, because over your mouth. Um, for my inner vision, I saw that uh, one of the young ones here started to feed, and they when the parent puts its beak down into the uh, beak of a, a, a young bird to give it food, and then the sound is different. <laughs> that was just uh, my inner movie running, and I put the sound to what I saw. <laughs> uh, yes, I, I would say that if you really want to know uh, the calls of a bird, uh, it is quite a lot of different sounds. 
Some birds have a, a, an astonishing uh, voc vocabulary. vocabulary. Mm. Um, for instance, the eagle owl, which goes woo for the male and woo for the female. They have, uh, they can tell you really with a, with a sound that <laughs> don't come too close. I'm afraid of you. The, the other owls approach. Um, if you uh, if you come closer, I will certainly have to make a contra attack. If you hear <laughs> like this, then it means I'm uh, better ranked than you. I will attack you if you stay any longer in my territory. If uh, uh, a male or a fe female has a prey, uh, they may call the attention to somebody else by making <coughs> that sound, which means I have food, really only that. But it is also a signal to the young one for, for, from the female that she is there with food. And he immediately starts saying <coughs> this. <coughs> If the, now uh, somebody is approaching uh, the owl's nest, the male will scream very, very powerful, uh, a very powerful call, <coughs> like that, or <coughs> even higher up if it is the female. Did I break the microphone? Or? It's still working. <laughs> and uh, the most interesting is perhaps when, uh, when the two meet in March. The male has defended it, his territory all winter long, or especially now in February, March, he has started to call this woo. And when the female arrives, she starts uh, a duet yes. going woo, and he is woo, calling that way. They go on for a long time until suddenly you see that he flies right down to the place where he uh, has selected where to place the eggs. He starts to make a demonstration there, which goes like that. And in the same time, he starts to scratch up a hole in the ground. Uh, I can tell you this, and you would not say anything against me because I'm the only one who has seen it. <laughs> I certainly have <laughs> So No, nobody has seen it uh, except me. So they but, have a very wide vocabulary, in fact. They have. They have quite a fantastic uh, amount of words <laughs> to say, so to say, uh, so to say. Yeah, and we were chatting just now, and, and you were saying that when you walk in the Swedish countryside, you can hear all the sounds around you, and you know what each of those sounds is, is telling you. You can read what's going on and what's making the sounds. Do, do yes. you think you could imagine for us that you're walking perhaps in the woodland somewhere near your home and that you're hearing some of these sounds and they're telling you mm -hmm. what's going on? Mm, yes. In Sweden, if I go out now, say in May, someday, we would be able to start 12 o'clock in the night. The first thing mostly in the forest there is... the red start would start it and now see if I can produce uh, number two well it's a clumsy imitation but all uh, robins would go for it and come very close if you imitate it so and then you would start to hear uh, our friend the uh, blackbird and also all the other thrushes, like this, perhaps. And uh, when the sun comes up a little bit more, you would hear Is it willow warbler you call it, the little green thing? Yes. Uh, you know, uh, sometimes I... I it's the one that it. looks very like a chiff chaff. Yes. Mm -hmm. You mean the... Ah, 
I noticed that today when I was out that it had sli a slightly different a, a slight difference to our chief chef in Sweden. Has it? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, ours has always uh, a longer stretch of notes and not so very rapid. And uh, there is another sound in between. It sounds like a tre tre sort of winding up noise. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Mm. yes. Perhaps yours. Yes, I asked, yours asked us that too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Anyhow, um. there is a whole forest of sounds so you can put in anything. Perhaps um, you have this uh, Picus viridis. What do you call it? Green uh, woodpecker. Green, green woodpecker. Yes. Which isn't very far from the sound of a black woodpecker, which um, oh, we don't have. Them. You don't have, but we have uh, rather commonly. Uh, it comes flying. <laughs> Very, very uh, easy to hear when it comes flying. It goes in big uh, bows like that through the forest. And when it goes to a tree, it will start uh, making movements with the head and... If you imitate that, it, uh, you are nearly bound to have it coming when you see it flying uh, through the forest. You've been telling me how, how easy it is to get them to, to approach you when you make these imitations. Mm. Do you then make use of this, as you are a filmmaker, uh, to get yes. birds and, and mammals yes. to approach for you to film them? Uh, very often so. Um, for instance, if I want, uh, want a bird to come to a certain tree, I know it, it usually comes to this and that uh, branch. I put point my camera there and I imitate it and mostly I succeed in having it coming, flying into the picture and landing there. So of course that is a, I have a little bit favor there. But aren't the birds absolutely mystified when they turn up and they don't find the bird they expected? Yes, uh, that may happen. But <laughs> funny enough, I can tell you that around my summer house, uh, in Sweden, if I only go out and I don't imitate anything, all the birds start to sing at once. Very, very quickly, they are all singing because they know that I am that peculiar blackbird, chaffinch, whatever you say. They know that you they are all I the birds am, rolled I am into this one. one. And they have to defend their territory, even if I don't sing. And I remember one little uh, pygmy owl who once spotted me in the, in the middle of the summer when, when they never call and it came from a distance of 50 yards or something like that and hit me just because I happened to walk over the same place where I had been imitating it a, a, a lot too much in the <laughs> springtime. <laughs> I know it's often very difficult for filmmakers. They come back and they find that perhaps the sound of some particular bird is missing. They haven't managed to record it when they were out filming. Now, it seems to me it's very tempting for you, since you're so <laughs> good at it, to, to put in an imitation yeah. rather than a recording. In my first film, I did so. I must admit, I did so. And then for a number of films, I put in one bird voice somewhere in the background, like a sort of a Hitchcock. Uh, oh, you uh, Hitchcock thing. appears yeah, in all his yes. films. So I, I wanted one of my bird imitations to appear in each film. And uh, now I don't do it, but I, I did so for a long time, really. <laughs> and uh, uh, I'm happy to say that nobody has uh, told me that they found that bird very. Uh, remarkable or something I see. like that. You were saying a bit earlier on when we were talking about ravens that there was a sound they made that you found you couldn't really imitate. Are there many sounds you find that you can't do? Mm -hmm. Sometimes a uh, sound is impossible, more or less impossible to to, uh, to imitate. But the funny thing is that you may make a bad imitation uh, but still they will go for it. This is, I presume, because a bird must be uh, must be prepared to take up a fight with uh, a rival which has a slightly different uh, song, uh, or is a bad songster. Still, he he must be driven away from the territory. 
So I presume that's why. Otherwise, as you know, birds have a much finer hearing than ours. They can distinguish, uh, uh, for instance, that it is uh, 11 syllables in a tune which to us sounds like three or four. It's too rapid for our <coughs> ear to um, perceive. But they do it. So how do you manage with something like, say, a wren, which has these fantastic yeah. trills? Can uh, you do that? I did this th this morning. Uh, it uh, works, but I know my imitations, especially heard with the ears of a bird, would just be like uh, an elephant trying to dance walls. But, of course, it works. It's clumsy, and but it has something that uh, triggers off this uh, wren to answer, and a good thing. <laughs> Jan, I know that you've done a lot of travelling and a lot of your filming in, in South America, haven't you? Yes. Now, most of us haven't ever been there and probably never will. I wonder if you could let us hear one or two of your favourite sounds from that country. Yes. Well... I have a lot of favorites because this is the region where you really see birds. I mean, South America is the continent where you find most of the birds and fantastic uh, songsters and fantastic sounds. Every morning when I wake up in my camp in the Kanaku Mountains, uh, I call to uh, some friends of mine and they come right up in the very, very high mora trees uh, at the camp. Uh, I hope I can take it now. <clears throat> it really isn't good for the voice. <clears throat> yeah, I can still, I can still <laughs> speak. And uh, this is the red-billed uh, red toucan. And they will at once come right up to me. I tried many times to film these birds when they did it. And always I had a lot of branches in my way, so I couldn't. Then I got the picture in a funny way. I, were, I was out with some ornithologists in Suriname. And uh, we were discussing things. And I had we, we traveled by car. I had all my equipment in the car and we were discussing things. And they said, so what's the difference between the red-billed toucan and uh, the sulfur-breasted? Well, the sulfur-breasted goes like this, I said, and the red-billed like that. And we continued speaking. And then suddenly I saw a toucan coming up to a dry <laughs> branch, sitting there, excellent, uh, against blue sky. So I continued speaking to them about what we were discussing, calling to the bird taking out all the equipment, putting up the long lens, and I filmed it, calling, and <laughs> I was very happy about it because yeah. it's very difficult in the dense rainforest to get a film at all of birds. Mm. And, of course, I like thrushes, and the most beautiful of all the thrushes in South America, I uh, I wouldn't like to compare it perhaps to the uh, the blackbird because that is one of my true favorites, but that bird, when you hear it in the mountainous region, uh, with all the other sounds, it's, it is really the pan flute of the tropical forest. You have, as we say, a frog in your throat, Jan. Ah, it must be a buffo marinus, I think. <laughs> a buffo marinus, what's yes, that? Uh, uh, well, my throat wouldn't be able to hold it, but it can hold the sound if you're interested. Yes. It's a, a very big toad, actually, not a frog, but a toad which uh, sings very deep when the rainy season just is about to start. We hear them from everywhere. And now Jan's taking a glass of water to help with this one. Mm. No. Uh, when I 
they go to an Indian village, uh, th this is what they really want to hear. And uh, some other birds, they they keep the the young the children, they run all around me and say, imitate so and so, that and that bird. And they say moody sometimes moody, and moody is this sound. Let's see if I can take it. Good heavens! This is needing a pullover arm. <coughs> Sounds like Homo sapiens yes, to me. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> a baby. Yes. yes. And once uh, in the Rupununi savanna, there is a little shop, and the shopkeeper is a friend of mine. I came in there and I started to buy what things I needed for my next trip up to the Canoes. And two Indians came in and sat down, and after a while he asked them, "What do you want?" Well, and one man said in the Makusi language something and pointed at me. And he said, funny, this man asks me if I can ask you to imitate a child. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, I said, I can do that. And I made this imitation. And uh, then <laughs> the other Indian uh, frowned, you say, huh? Yes. yes. And the, this other Indian looked very, very happy. And the frowning Indian took out a one dollar, Cayenne dollar bill and gave it to the other one. They had made a bet if I could do it or not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and can we just end? I, it's difficult to ask people which they think is the most beautiful bird song or sound that they've heard. But can you choose one that you think is, is beautiful? Well, uh, it is like trying to draw something very beautiful with uh, without being the true artist. So the best sounds are actually better heard out in the in the right surrounding. And I suggest that everybody goes out and tries to find this special bird which goes mostly to his or her heart. I think. We all should try, either we imitate or not, to be out as much as possible and enjoy what is around us. Jan Lindblad was talking to Dillis Breeze.